get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, anyone working one-on-one with clients who don't want to just trade time for dollars and they want to shift to more one from one on one work to one to many work and if you go to rise25.com you can learn more we have uh, what's called our free dream product ladder which basically is just a business plan on one sheet of paper which helps you see gaps and untapped revenue potential you know companies like disney apple the sporting industry they all use versions of the product ladder so today i'm very excited we have someone who You know, people whisper up about behind closed doors and high-level entrepreneur groups because they want his advice. We have Roland Frazier. He's founded, scaled, or sold almost two dozen different businesses ranging from consumer products to industrial machine manufacturing companies with adjusted sales ranging from $3 million to $337 million. He's completed infomercial deals with Guthy Ranker and KTEL Direct, publishing deals with Simon & Schuster Random House, negotiated shows with major hotels on the Las Vegas Strip and been involved in over 100 private and public offerings and, if you can believe it, much more than that. Roland currently is principal in Idea Incubator, which owns digitalmarketer.com and nativecommerce.com and works in marketing businesses with Ryan Dice, Perry Belcher, Frank Kern, and many other digital marketing thought leaders. Roland, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate all those people that you had at the beginning. You're like, we have people like this, this, and this, and I was thinking, and then we couldn't have any of those today, so we got rolled. So. <laughs> Not true <laughs> I'm at happy all. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Not true at all. You know, there's so much that you've done in your career, and um, I mean, you went from selling real estate when you were 18 to real estate development, business investments, and leveraged buyouts while you're in college and law school, and after law school, started a practice that grew to one of the top law firms in San Diego, and began forming venture deals with clients. And your practice eventually evolved um, to buying and selling companies and repositioning businesses um, and direct response marketing. I consider you, you know, one of the top direct response marketers out there uh, with what you do. So um, I'm just, I want to go start early on, which is, so did you grow up in an entrepreneurial household? Yeah, um, I, I did. My, uh, my father was uh, a tax attorney. He, He came from kind of nothing. And uh, he worked his way through um, college working at the Internal Revenue Service of all of the unpopular professions that you could possibly imagine. And um, then he went up, kind of climbed the ranks at the IRS and um, used that to fund him uh, his his ability to go through law school as well. Mm. When he graduated law school, he started... Uh, since he was already at the IRS, he was an attorney for the Internal Revenue Service as well, and then ultimately um, realized that he could make a whole lot more money and have a lot more fun moving from the dark side to the good side and uh, <laughs> and leaving there. And, uh, and so I had the benefit of him being a tax and business attorney and listening to the deals and getting to be involved with, with that uh, to some extent. From and, a young and age. That lights a fire, you know, under you. It really does. Yeah. What'd you learn from your dad? Gosh, the, uh, I, I learned so much. I really did. Uh, most of it was, uh, was how to negotiate hmm. and how important it is to know the numbers behind deals to actually, to, to really know how numbers work is, is a huge deal to know how taxes work is actually also a big deal and has been, um, really the difference in a whole lot of deals and negotiations uh, in my life, both personally and in working with you know clients when I was practicing law and, um, and in deals. It's like it, just the simple, the simple difference of knowing what shows up uh, on an income statement or a balance sheet can, can make or break a deal. I remember one in particular where I was sitting in a deal um, and I ended up with about 
he ended up with about five million dollars in in stock out of this deal, and it was almost going to die because the CFO was concerned about the impact on earnings per share of this particular acquisition of my company um, by this company. It was a publicly held company. And um, and I'm sitting there talking to the CEO, and he's like, well, no, we can't do this because uh, the impact on EPS is going to be uh, too significant. It's going to look bad, and then the price is going to go down, and shareholders are going to pitch a fit. And I was like, well, that's actually a balance sheet transaction. That's not going to show up. It's not going to hit your EPS at all. It's not an income statement. It's a balance sheet thing. And he's like, he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, get your CFO that said that in here. And and I'm sitting there talking to the guy and I know enough about it to actually have the conversation and walk him through it. And he's yeah. like, oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. I didn't. And he's like, well, that was a $5 million swing, <laughs> right? But Good thing and, you had that and, background. And I'll tell yeah. you, like making deals, it's a huge advantage to, to know your numbers. So um, what I got, I guess... Um, I guess probably the most valuable I thing I got, if I think about it that way, is um, I listen. I actually listened to him, and um, I went and I got a, I got my degree in accounting. You don't need a degree in accounting to know financial statements, but it you know it obviously helps. Um, so I got a degree in accounting. I got a law degree, and um, those are invaluable tools in all of the deals that I do. So you, the first thing that jumped to you was how to negotiate. Yes. Right. So. Talk about that for a second. Uh, yeah, it's it's um, what I if I refine that down, I remember, uh, and this is uh, this is going to date me, but uh, when Richard Nixon was going through the impeachment process, I think it was John Dean and a couple of the other people were saying really bad things about him, and um, I remember my dad saying, um, you know, people say things when they're mad or when they're stressed that they really don't mean mm. because um, what those guys are saying is coming from a place of fear. And, um, and that really stuck with me. And so it, it has helped me both professionally and personally when times are tough and things are not going well and people get all upset and excited to think about that and to think that not taking it personally, this, this is coming from, um, this is coming from a place of fear or a place of emotion. And I really need to disregard it. Um, because it's probably not exactly the truth about how this person feels. Hmm. And that helps me give people the benefit of the doubt. Hmm. Um, which is a wonderful thing to give people probably the best gift hmm. you can ever give anyone is the benefit of the doubt. Hmm. I love that. Um, and for you, did you know when you were going to law school that you were going to shift to something different? I didn't. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted uh, to be when I grew up, and I, and I still don't know. So um, I, I, I have, you know, in one of the, I was thinking about uh, like a good book title would be The Seven Lives We Live or something like that because I have had a life as a musician, yeah. as, as a musician. real estate yeah. Oh, yeah. I played in bands uh, in clubs from age 15 to 42. So, what did you uh, play? I played keyboards and bass. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so I did that because that basically uh, allowed me to have money in high school. And then I sold real estate and then I developed real estate and then I did leverage buyouts and then I practiced law and um, then I became a, um, you know, a kind of a marketing investor type person. And it's like, I think all of the most interesting people I know have had many lives and yeah. um, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. So that's the, uh, how was the shift from, you know, a lot of times people identify themselves from their profession, you know, say I'm a lawyer or I'm a doctor or whatever the case is. How was that shift from when you completely stopped officially practice? I mean, you still use it obviously daily, but stop practicing um, on a daily basis. Well, what you do is you, you can turn it into something funny. I tell people that I'm a recovering attorney that right. a lot of people say has not fully recovered. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I think it's I, – I, I had a, one of my closest friends uh, when I was in high school. His father came and spoke at our school, and um, 
his entire speech really impacted me. And his entire speech was, don't ever let people label you. And for God's sake, don't do it for them. And so I've always been very careful mm. to not say I'm defining myself as an attorney or as, mm. and, and what's really funny is my, uh, uh, my wife said that uh, when she we we met online on Match. dot com, and um, she said uh, uh, she didn't really ever exactly know what to tell people I did because I don't have a traditional job like an attorney or whatever. <laughs> right. And so she told her father. Her father was like, you know, what does he what does he do? And she said, well, I mean, and he was like, oh, 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 it's okay. You don't have to say. And he thought I was a drug dealer. <laughs> I was like, man, it's like, she's like, well, he obviously. He fine with you, that, actually. Yeah, that, obviously, that if you can't say what someone does, they are clearly a drug dealer because that's the default category, right? <laughs> I thought but, he was going to um, say entrepreneur. It's okay, I know. Yeah, right. you know, it's really funny because entrepreneur is, uh, is such a broad term. It's kind of, you know, it's like, and, and I don't, I still don't know what to say. You know, I just, I basically say, I, I try to be, uh, and although I don't know that I succeed always, I try to be a smart money investor, hmm. right? I want to I want to invest in companies where I can take an active role and bring value beyond money, hmm. and um, so that's what I tell people now. But um, you know, I I don't know. So I want to talk about maybe not all seven lives, but a few of the lives and the um, you know, when you were a lawyer, is that when you started working with Guthy Ranker? It was, yeah. Okay. I represented Tony Robbins in uh, in infomercial deals and deals with uh, Simon and Schuster and United Artists when he was doing those things. And um, I met um, uh, Bill Guthy and Greg Rinker as as a part of doing that. And um, um, one of my part, one of my law partners and I um, basically were talking with them and said, you know, how these infomercials are kind of cool. And Tony's was obviously very successful. Uh, how tell us more about this because I'm always curious about uh, that's my favorite thing about what I do now and what what I did practicing law was seeing all the different ways that people make money and so I was fascinated with this with the the infomercial world and was like okay well how how does that work how many of those work out and they were like well in the industry it's typically one in ten that make money but we're better at it than most people and we you know kind of know what we're doing so it's usually one in five and we said well gosh. Um, who puts up that money? And they said, we do. And I said, well, what if we put up the money? What if what if we went out and raised the money and we were the executive producers on these things and you gave the ones that you thought had the best shot of working out to us and um, you've got to, you're going to do that, you're going to raise that money somewhere anyway. Right. How about if we do that? And, um, and we ended up doing um, 14 infomercials uh, together. And, um, and then I did a couple with some other companies and that was a really interesting experience, but that, that was how that, uh, how that came about through what, Tony. What did you, what do you think made them that successful with, you know, basically the industry standard and having such a higher success rate? I, I think that, I think that you can dramatically increase your odds of success by focusing on one thing obsessively. And I think that they, they hired the best people and worked with the best people. And, um, they were, they were in at the beginning from a, from a timing is everything standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, went from, uh, duplicating tapes in, in their garage to, you know, <laughs> having billion dollar companies. I mean, they're arguably one of the best companies doing direct response in the world. I would, I would absolutely. think, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they've, and they've evolved as well. You know, they went from, uh, they kind of went from, um, they went from a lot of, um, informational stuff into physical products, which I think was really smart. And, um, they went to continuity in the turn in the form of proactive as opposed right. to one time sales, like they were getting when they were doing personal power and things like that. And they've used celebrity and influencers very well. They've been on trend really well. And um, they've done a great job of building in upsells. If you've ever tried to order anything through, you you go through an endless process of upsells. <laughs> and so, right. so like media capture, return on uh, ad spend, all of that stuff. They're just they're just really, you know, really dialed in on all that stuff. And and they also pick good products. So I think I think just an obsessive uh, uh, 
attention to detail with a kick-ass team and staying on trend is is very very helpful to them Roland, after you shifted from your own law firm what did you do next um, I well, I had uh, the internet was kind of coming into being, so I started a channel on CompuServe. Um, CompuServe, I, I all right, yeah. Had always been, yeah, right, way back. My I had first email um, address, yeah. <laughs> CS dot com, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, I uh, there was a I was practicing law at the time, and I kind of saw that that was coming, and so we had come across um, uh, a kind of a relatively famous makeup artist who has since passed away and a hairstylist named John Frieda who's gone on to have big lines and things like that. And so we did uh, a thing with them in the beauty space and then America Online uh, came in and we had mail. So we um, uh, did a thing with other clients. I had uh, Dennis Waitley and Brian Tracy mm. and a lot of those. What were you doing with them? Through Tony, legal work. Oh, okay. And then, and then you I had everyone doing... in the industry. You had the, yeah, the people. It, it's really funny. It's just all of the, you know, all of like when you start representing athletes, we represented professional football players and I got one person and then I had 20 within no time. I get one motivational guru person and then you have 20 within no time. It's, <laughs> it's really interesting. If you can infiltrate these little insular yeah. uh, niches of people, you end up, especially at the higher levels, you end up plugged in with everyone, which is kind of what I ended up doing on the uh, digital marketing side too. It's just, I had one pretty significant success and then people kind of wanted to get to know me. And then I got brought into the, you know, to the inner circle. And now I know you know, and talk with a lot of the major players on a regular basis and their friends. Had you heard of those guys before? I mean, obviously Tony Robbins was big, but the other people mm -hmm. before they came to you? You know, what was really funny uh, is that as I was, uh, when I was maybe 14 years old or so, mm -hmm. uh, my dad had in the back of his car when he was taking me to school one day, um, which was not a normal event, but he had in the back of his car. And I really liked it when I got to spend time with him. Uh, this folded over weird plasticky looking thing with a horrible I graphic. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> called, the, called The Psychology of Winning by, yes. by Denise Waitley, Waitley, I thought, because it's D-E-N-I-S, <laughs> yes. right? So, uh, so I had heard of him, and I, at the time I had never heard of goal setting and all that kind of stuff. And I happened to listen. They were cassettes. And I happened to listen to them and was just blown away. I was like, holy crap, you Millennials can set Millennials right now are asking, what are cassette tapes? They're exactly. like square-shaped things with two <laughs> holes, and you put them in. <laughs> I don't even want to go. Anyways. <laughs> think of, think of uh, an iPod, basically. <laughs> and even that's not current, right? Think of an audio file. But um, yeah, so, that, so it was really funny to have known of Dennis – long, long, long ago. Yeah. And uh, I'll actually tell you to a couple of those things. And then the same thing about Tony. When I, when I went to law school, uh, my first year of law school, I moved out to California from Virginia. And um, my father said, you've got to read this book by this guy, Tony Robbins. It's called Unlimited Power. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. And I read it and I thought it was amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. And then I went and read all those, I think it was seven books by... Um, Bandler and Grinder because that was the NLP neuro linguistic programming and I so I'm I'm like I go down into the footnotes of everything when yeah. I get interested in something yeah that's fantastic and, um, right and then uh, two years later I graduated from law school and um, a year after that I was partnered with a guy who uh, who knew Tony Robbins and represented him and we ended up merging our law firm mm. with this guy and I was actually represented I was like God oh, this is such a weird world um uh, and then a few a few years later i um we hired william shatner to speak at one of our events and because we wanted to do something with him on the senior side and we thought he'd be a good representative and i remember lying on the floor in my grandmother's house watching episodes of star trek mm -hmm. as a really little kid being scared out of my wits <laughs> because you know all those guys in the red shirts were dying and uh and uh seeing him on there. And then, you know, I, the first time that he called me on my cell phone, I'm, I was driving along with my wife and he's like, Roland, this is Bill. How are you doing? You know, and I was like, 
I looked at her and I was like, this is just surreal. It is, and yet yeah. those surreal moments happen again and again and again. Um, it's it's trippy. It really is. That's cool. What, Roland, what did you learn from just, I mean, because you're having interpersonal conversations with, with some of these people. What did you learn from Tony Robbins? Just not from his program, not from his book, but just from talking to him or even observing how he um, does business, per, you know, firsthand. What did I learn from him? Um, I, I would say that uh, I'd, I'd say that I, I learned that I, I don't I don't know that that it crystallized with him, but but one thing that I certainly noticed was that he really cares about the people that he. Um, that are his market. He actually really does. And that he's very sincere in it. And I, I run across a whole lot of people who are not, hmm. and, um, especially practicing law because you kind of see the problems that happen. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and there, yeah. there were people who yeah. represented themselves as being one thing and had all kinds of problems because they weren't really that thing that they projected out to the world, but that Tony was, in integrity with what he put out there and sincerely wanted people in, you know, you, you, you have people, even when you are in integrity that will attack you and that, that they don't understand or right. circumstances happen that it, you know, might appear that you're not, but he really cared and, and wanted to do the right thing all the time. And I liked that. And I also liked that, um, he researched the hell out of anybody or any place or anything that he was doing and was prepared better than anybody I had ever met. Hmm. And, uh, you know, not just like, don't, don't do certain things when you're in India culturally sign wise, because that might, you know, be offensive to somebody, but down to the weather and the, you know, the challenges that they had and everything else. I mean, that guy's obsessed with, um, which kind of goes to all the people, all the people that I know who are successful, like, you know, like got the ringer, same thing. It's like, if you're obsessed with being amazing and providing incredible value and knowing what you're talking about and who you're talking to, it, it makes a giant difference. Yeah. Um, so how did it come to be that you became partners with Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher? So Cause you I make was, this jump uh, from you are football players and then you're the you know really representing the top motivational speakers. They probably don't like the term motivational speaker, but um, though that crowd. And now you are in the world of uh, Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher. Yeah. So so my two favorite things, my three favorite things about practicing law were all the different ways that people can make money, um, all the stories that you hear. The stories are fantastic. And, um, selling, I discovered that I liked selling more than I liked anything else. So I loved to go, uh, into the conference room with prospective clients and close the deal. And we were, um, a fairly innovative law firm in that, um, when I started practicing, there were 325 attorney, there was like you know, one attorney for every 325 people in California. I read an article on it. It was like, legal firms are, there's too much. You can't possibly succeed as a lawyer. I just hung my shingle, right? It's like, lawyers are doomed to failure. I was like, oh, okay, interesting. So I've got to just, I've got to distinguish myself. I'm yeah. like, you know, so that's the first thing I think is no, uh-uh, not me. And, um, and then I read an article in the uh, American Bar Journal uh, uh, that said, um, it was, uh, it was, a uh, guy at a big company and he said, you know, you can hire someone for the, for a flat fee to build the Taj Mahal, but you can't hire an attorney for a flat fee to file a simple paper for you. Mm. And I hate that. And everybody hates that. And I was like, haha, that's kind of cool. So I bought yellow page ads with the, with the money that I did not have and um, which were expensive at the time. And that was kind of the, main way to advertise at the time. Right. And, um, and I put in big, big, bold letters, flat fee. We'll do things on a flat fee. Wow. You want to do a lawsuit, flat fee. You want to do a will, flat fee. You want to do any, and nobody was doing it. And 
people loved it. And so our practice just grew crazy, crazy, crazy fast because, um, because of that. Did that just light bulb click in your head when you heard just going against the grain, no one's doing it? Or I love, I have always loved, um, I've always loved going against the grain. <laughs> I have always loved, if you tell me you can't do that, uh, I had a conversation until two in the morning last night with, with my old law partner and my director of events and one of my closest friends telling me that I couldn't scale this thing <laughs> that I was telling you about before we got on. Right. And, and I said, I absolutely can. And here's examples of other people in similar things that have done it, even though they haven't done it here. And I know it can happen. So I guess I, I absolutely start with an impossible to scale, impossible to do thing really turns me on. Right. Yeah. Maybe so, we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit because uh, it's really fascinating. So, so what brings you to Ryan Dice and Perry Melcher? How do you? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so the, what I was saying is, uh, I like selling. That was one of the things I like doing. Yeah. So I was, I was a student of sales and marketing because that was my favorite thing to do. So yeah. I wanted to find out how to get better at it. And as the internet came into existence and, and, um, I was studying the people who were doing things and I, uh, I bought, domains i owned uh, uh bet on it.com and make a bet and all these other crazy domain names and um it used to cost me fifty thousand dollars to build a website you gotta love that now you can it's do it with crazy WordPress yeah three minutes but anyway um so i wanted to learn how to market and so i studied all of the online marketing people yeah. uh you know I, I learned seo i learned how to program in cold fusion and ht you know <laughs> html and everything else because I, i'm because i'm stupid and crazy but um they were they were among some of the top people that seemed to actually be doing stuff and um, and doing it well and not just teaching something that was was old and I actually tried some of their stuff and it worked so they held this event called Traffic and Conversion Summit and I was like well that's kind of I should go and see and I went and it was the most disorganized long drawn out no breaks. Uh, Thing that you could ever imagine and it was the best most amazing wonderful content i took so many pages of notes my hand was cramped up and they wouldn't ever take a freaking break so i'd had to, i was like i go to the bathroom but i don't want to go because i don't want to miss anything and um and i was i was like these guys ab absolutely know what they're doing i want to get to know them better and one thing that i have learned is that if there is a channel of access that someone has created um the way to get to know them is the channel of access, not to like to go up to the stage and be among the masses that are doing that or uh, cold call them or anything else. So they had this mastermind called the War Room, which which now I run um, at the time, and I was like, okay, that's their channel of access. Mm. So um, I got to know. I don't know if you know Gary Halbert, um, famous copywriter from. Before. I mean, I don't. I know him. You know, from his work, but not personally. Okay. Yeah, I've interviewed yeah. almost all of his disciples okay cool. yeah so so yeah. so gary for example i'll give you a couple examples of this yeah. so shatner i want to do a deal with shatner i'm i know shatner speaks i'm going to hire shatner to speak i'm going to figure out how i don't have to pay the fee um i think his fee is 100 grand um but i don't want to pay 100 grand so i know my event can afford to pay 100 grand for a speaker so i'm going to have my event hire him and then I'm going to build into the contract that he goes to lunch with me afterwards so that I can talk with him and talk with him about the thing. I want to get to know Perry and Ryan. They have this thing called the war room. I'm going to join the war room because I know that then I'll be able to sit down with them. And so um, and Gary Halbert, just to tie that uh, that end, is uh, Gary Halbert. I'm reading all of his stuff. And I'm like, this guy's uh, amazing copywriter. And um, I read that he had a thing where you could pay 25 grand and go down uh, to Florida and he would coach you for two weeks or three weeks, some ridiculous period of time. So I emailed him and I said, uh, I said, Hey, I know you do this thing. Um, I'd like to do it. And he's like, yeah, send me the money. Uh, and you know, and we can talk. So I sent him the money and he emailed me back and he's like, nobody ever sends me the money. You actually sent me the money. And I said, yeah, I want to, I want to do this. And I go down and, uh, and meet with him and he's like, That's he's awesome. just kind of grumpy crudge mudge. And he's like, he's like, so what do you want to write copy for? And I said, I said, I don't actually want to write copy, but I wanted to meet you because I would like to do business with you. And I figured that the best way to do that is to to go through a channel that allows us to sit down face to face. And he said, 
Yeah, that's really smart. And we ended up doing a bunch of stuff together. So uh, tell anyway, me a good um, Gary Halbert story. I'm sorry? The, the People always seem to have good Gary Halbert stories. Oh, I just, uh, I, he's just, he was, you know, uh, he passed away yeah. uh, a few years after that. But um, I, he, he, was just, he, he was just a mess. It, but my, all of my best friends are a mess, right? That that are super successful, and he had uh, he, he was just he was just this grumpy genius guy. Um, I, I wish that I could have recorded how he described writing copy hmm. because it was this amazingly painful, agonizing process. Of he's like you know you dip down into the lowest depths of the muckiest you know, drag and slug through it and, you know, pull up out of it your copy, you know, leaving parts of your soul behind. It was like amazing <laughs> description of what it was like. I was like, holy crap, that's uh, that's that's why you're so fantastic at it. So what did but you anyway, do so for, for, for yeah. Ryan? I, I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, go, I was going to say, what did you do for two or three weeks if you were like, I'm, I'm just, I'm not here to write copy. Yeah. So okay. So so basically, I, I met him. I met him in a Denny's. That was where he wanted to meet in Miami, and um, uh, and he said, uh, I just kind of went with the flow first. I and you know I said I've got I've got a business. You know, direct mail business. I've had it for uh, for a few years at the time, and um, so you know I I would love to uh, you know to see how to do that better. Yeah. And so he said he said all right. Well, here, do this and write me some copy on this. And then, uh, whenever you're done with it, give me a call. It's like, okay. And that was it. That was our first meeting. It was like 18 minutes. <laughs> and, um, so I go back to my hotel room and I, I wrote it. I wrote out the thing that we talked about and, um, I called him and he's like, he's like, you're done already. I was like, I said, yeah. And he's like, all right, I'm going to come by. So he comes by my hotel room and he sits down and he reads it because I had to write it out longhand. That's the only way he would do it. And, and he was like, he said, uh, what the fuck do you hire me to write, teach you how to write copy for? You know how to write copy. And I told him then, I said, I said, well, actually, I did that. And that was when he said that's smart. And, um, and then we kind of, the wall went down and we actually got to talk uh, uh, peer to peer, I guess. And, mm. and, you know, obviously he could write copy way better than I could. But, um, and, uh, and we started talking about what we could do together. It just for some reason, the wall went down and, you know, and he was telling me all these crazy stories and, you know, then I'm over at his house and, uh, his buddy, John Carlton called and I, he, he's, he, they were writing the next, uh, newsletter together. And I, he's like, you know, he's like, I can't do it. And John's like, I can't type either. And I was like, I can type really fast. I'll type it. So they're dictating the thing and I'm adding my stuff in. And it was like, and we're this, you know, little trio of, and I'm in it again, surreal, right? I'm with this, you know, right. this guy doing that. So it's, it's just funny. So with Ryan and Perry, um, I knew that I had to stand out at this mastermind and I knew I found out that they had this thing called Wicked Smart and Wicked Smart was and still to this day is where you take your proven super cool amazing marketing thing marketing um, trick hack whatever you want to call it and um, it, ca it no, no ideas allowed it has to be proven and you present it to the group and the group at the mastermind votes on it and whoever gets the most votes wins this wicked smart award which at the time was like a mac computer or something which they never gave you and still to this day i never got my prize ryan and perry uh, so so i was like okay i gotta win this and i had no idea what was going to do it um but at the traffic and conversion summit i went to the big thing was how do you get the email addresses for your facebook friends off of Facebook to be able to email them. And I was like, okay. And this girl had gotten up and won Wicked Smart at the thing by saying, well, Yahoo actually allows you to suck uh, 200 of those names off and then you've got them, but you can't get more than 200. And I was like, okay, well, if she won with 200 and I could get people to get 5,000, then I can probably win Wicked Smart. And so I just set about trying to figure out how to do that and ended up, it's interesting that we're on Skype, ended up finding that if you imported your uh, contacts from Facebook into Skype, there was a screen that came up halfway through the process mm. that showed all of the email addresses of your Facebook friends as it was sucking in. Once it was done, you couldn't see them in Skype, but there was the screen. So I was like, well, if a screen shows up, there's bound to be a way to capture it. 
And so I figured out how to capture it, and I gave that as my wicked smart idea, and along with two others, because I was like, I'm play the odds, and um, and both Ryan and Perry got really excited about it, and I I got almost every single vote in the room, and then Perry came over and was like, Hey man, hey hey, you got it. We got to go to dinner. You got to go to dinner with me, and I want you to sit across from me because I want to talk to you. And I was like, All right, that's great. And then we ended up <laughs> right. we ended up hitting it off. Yeah. Uh, Perry's kind of like my my brother from another mother, uh, and we just really hit it off super well, and um, ended up uh, doing things socially together. And then I had the opportunity when uh, a CEO of their business left, and I was giving them advice. I always give advice, by the way. Uh, I always help people. I look yeah. for opportunities to give value with no expectation, seriously, sincerely, no expectation of a benefit. Um, and I just find that that's the most self-interested thing you can do is to <laughs> is right. to be selfless because yeah. it comes back to you so many times. And so I help them, since I have the background that I have, I was able to help with them with a lot of uh, things over a period of a few years. And when this... CEO left uh, the opportunity to have equity in the company um, was available and they said, you know, hey, what would you think about doing this? And I was like, I, I think that'd be great. So that's how I became part of I love that, Ron. I love that. And uh, anyone who reads what you write, watches your videos, hears you, gets that right away that you just cool. want to help, you want to add value and with no expectations. Um, what, what worked? I mean, you've been at the traffic conversion conferences since the beginning what has worked to grow because it's the go-to event for marketer i mean i i consider it the go-to event you know up mm -hmm. until when i went people were like did you go to traveling conversion did you go to traveling conversion why haven't you gone <laughs> to traveling conversion so right. it's you know it attracts you know five six seven thousand marketers probably more next year and the more after that and you'll fill a stadium at some point right um, we're, we're actually you you have to plan when you get a bigger event about three years in advance mm. so you're making a bet three years from now yeah based on where you are as to how many people you'll need and we are in the process now of uh, of moving three four years from now into convention centers because the right. space isn't available if you don't book it in advance so it's it's a big bet but yeah we're we want you know, we want to be at a hundred thousand people. Yeah. What has worked to grow it? And what, what did you think would work that didn't work? Cause obviously even got the rank of the top direct response marketing company, you know, is still one out of five, right? That's, yep. it's still crazy. It's, you're, right. They're failing. I don't know. It's learning you know, four out of five times. Yeah. So yeah. What, what has not worked that you thought this is a slam dunk. This is going to work for sure. It's it's a really really great question. Um, what what um, ha has worked is an easier question than what is not okay. because there there isn't anything that I can think of that I thought was going to be a slam dunk because I truly know that you don't know. Right? <laughs> right. Um, ask the twenty year old version of me, and I would be like, everything was going to work. You know. Now I'm like, ah. uh, so. So let me tell you the things that have made a difference. How about that? Yeah, sure. Um, what what I what I you asked me what I learned from Tony, and I actually gave you a bad answer because uh, because what I really learned from Tony was um, that was the three M's: uh, mentoring, modeling, and masterminding. Hmm. And I don't think he calls it the three M's, but that that was an easy way for me to remember it. That that if you can model other people's success, and that truly I learned from him. If you can think like somebody else thinks who is successful and do the things that they did, then that is a model that will likely work for you, um, short of being, you know, seven feet tall to play in the NBA or something. Like right, that. But, yeah. But then you got Kobe, right? It's hard to model so, that, right? Yeah. So um, so I am a big fan and have, have been ever since then of how can I, in, in, how can I improve my odds of succeeding? It's to model how can I improve my odds of succeeding? It's to find a single one-on-one um, -on -one relationship with one or more mentors who have been where I want to be before, who can help me uh, discern the models to follow and the thoughts to have. And then how can I get with a group of people who are like-minded so that I will raise my thermostat to the level of success that they have through some sort of mastermind? And so in events, 
I looked at, went to hundreds of events. Um, at, when I when I came in, I took over events, so I I run uh, the event side of that. We have uh, a genius in Richard Lindner, who's the president of Digital Marketer, who uh, excels at filling events, and I've been very fortunate to um, to bring on. Uh, a lady named Deanna Rogers, who is our director of events, who does all of the logistics, but kind of the the strategy, I guess, uh, of it, I have had a big hand in. So not not at all without an amazing team that helps making that happen. But uh, so I, I I when I took that over, I was like, there, we had forty thousand dollars in sponsorship revenue, and um, and kind of a so-so production quality production value of right. like the content kind of, was off the charts but you said there was some logistical things yes. that, yeah yeah the content the content is is a huge deal because the, the the usp of digital marketer is we actually do this stuff right right we actually we don't just teach it we make more money doing it than we do teaching it right so um and that's which is probably it. fairly rare i mean you know fairly uncommon Right. It is. Yeah. yeah. Hugely uncommon. And um, so what has made it successful is that content. But it's also beyond that because it would not have grown. It didn't really take off the giant leap in, I think, making Traffic and Conversion Summit. What I what I absolutely consider to be a world class event is um, you have to attract you have to look the part you have to entertain people you have to take people out of the world of the venue that that exists as a shell before you populate it with your brand and permeate it with your brand and they have to walk into a world that just takes them in and and they are truly part of it and um so i proposed a dramatic increase in the quality and expense of AV mm. and branding and um, the first year that I really got which started. is a big deal by the way coming from someone who is all about direct response for you yeah. to say that right yeah yeah it's 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 important but branding is hugely important to direct response right hugely important that they're not it's not like people think, well, there's Coca-Cola that advertises for brand and they don't need people to respond. And then there's, you know, the, the infomercials that are like, you know, hey, buy my stuff. Um, and but they're, but the really they're really smart people do both. Right. So I, I said so the thing that made a huge difference was in 2014, we in 2013, we brought on a celebrity. Shatner was our first big celebrity and people were like. I mean, I, I had a lot of people that gave a lot, gave me a lot of criticism because mm -hmm. it was like, what does William Shatner have to do with digital marketing? And um, it turns like, out, who cares? You know, I watch him as a kid. I want just leave me alone. Um, and but but that's actually true for most of the people in the audience, right? Right. Is right. That, that he was Denny Crane or Captain Kirk or T.J. Hooker, God forbid. Um, you know, he was these characters that you know the guy had had a you know has had a long long career, and he's an interesting guy. And, um, and it raised the bar of, wow, these guys can pull an actual celebrity. And, um, so bringing celebrity in was a big deal. And then in 2014, I had the chance to raise the bar of that production quality and, and we went round and round about it and my partners were supportive, but skeptical. And when we, when we finished 2014, it was a hundred percent buy-in. It was oh my gosh this this was a big deal and and I believe that was a big turning point for us that raised the bar and by the way when you look good like that you can attract more money so we went from forty thousand dollars in sponsors um, the year before I came in to a few a few years later now um, we will have I think we're gonna be a little over two million in sponsors. That wow. that it basically almost pays for the event in the sponsors. And our sponsors have gone from. Uh, I wish I could think of some of the horrible sponsors we had. Uh, not horrible people, but like as far as brand equity, it, you know, we'd have you know. 
I can't even think of, you know, Joe's, Joe's CRM and, you know, Mike's, uh, um, right. Business opportunity, um, complete with finger guns. And, um, <laughs> and, um, now we have, uh, now we're talking to Google and we have Uber and we have Barnes and Noble and, uh, Infusionsoft and Maropus and all these iconic kinds of, uh, companies, American Express, right? Um, and now my focus is in moving from what we call endemic sponsors, the sponsors that are industry specific, to the non-endemic sponsors, so that we can get, um, you know, Callaway and Cadillac and all these other yeah. kinds of sponsors. And so that's and all to come up together, right? I mean, you have to have do. the people, yeah. you have the branding, you have to have the the experience, the AV, and all the the you know when someone gets there and the top name people and everything kind of has to come up together. Before you, it sounds like that you attract that. Yeah, and 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 then what you have to do, uh, going back to all the other stuff that we talked about, is you have to be obsessed with serving your customer. And at an event, most people make the mistake of thinking that the customer is the attendee. The customer is the attendee, but the customer is also the sponsor, and the customer 100%. is also the hotel, and the customer. I mean, you have multiple customers that you have to be thinking about. Right. And if you serve all of those people well, everybody buzzes about it. So for sponsorship, the, the reason that sponsors sponsorship has taken off is, number one, I, I basically um, scanned all of the industry websites and um, created a list of 1,800 sponsors that were sponsoring other events. Mm. And then we made a spreadsheet, and then Deanna and our team basically just divide and conquer grinded it out you know saying hey we got this event and now we have a pipeline of 1800 sponsors and um one thing that i saw was that a lot of the booths when you go to these events because i'm going to the events to learn about it a lot of the booths are empty i was like god why are the booths empty and then um i was like if the booths are empty because i actually wanted to talk to the people and uh, I was like, the booths are empty. These people aren't going to sell. Well, that seems kind of crazy. And so um, I-, I started talking to them, and they're like, well, we have to go and get lunch, and we have to you know, get a drink of water and all this. So I looked at that challenge, and um, Deanna and I talked, and we said, let's do a team of four concierge people whose job is to go and talk to all the sponsors and ask them what they need or what they want. Do you need lunch? Do you want drink? Mm. Do you want a beer at the end of the day? And we then we put on a lunch for them. We have a sponsor VIP room. We get them anything they want. We don't charge them for it. You want a beer? We're going to we're going to go get you a beer. And nobody does that. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody does that. So then when I when I, you know, social proof now, I'm like, OK, take a video team and interview all the sponsors about their experience. Oh, my God, it's the best thing ever. They took care of us and love us. And, you know, we can stay in the booths and sell. And now that reel goes out to all the future sponsors. And, you know, it's just all of that. Yeah. Stuff, you know, that that that's really important. You know, it was really impressive. I mean, the event's impressive. You know, I, you know, John and I loved it last year. And but was it was really impressive. You know, we we chatted with you for maybe five minutes and it really struck us when we talked about this. We still talk about it. And what's really amazing is you're always learning because you didn't say, this is great. Basically, you, you came to us, you said, how can we make this better? I mean, in the five-minute conversation and like, holy cow, like the person who is heading this up, it really just comes at as just wanting to constantly improve, constantly get feedback and... Um, that was, that was really amazing. So yeah, you have to, I, I, I try, I don't succeed always, but I try to walk every single booth and talk to every single, um, sponsor, everybody that's, that's at the events and say, how's it going? What could we do better? Actually, we had one, um, content and commerce is another event that we've got. And uh, there was a sponsor that, um, the, the layout of the event didn't turn out to be exactly like the blueprint of it. And I had not had the benefit of walking the hotel and which I normally do, but, um, I saw that there was a sponsor that was way down on the end. And I felt, I was like, how are you doing down here? And she's like, Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's good. And I'm like, are you getting anybody down here? And she said, she said, well, we're not getting as many as we'd hope, but blah, blah, blah. And so we went and talked to the fire marshal and said, I talked to Deanna. I said, let's, let's talk to the fire marshal. Can we get her booth moved down here where all the people are? Because it's yeah. kind of stinks that she's stuck way down here. 
And uh, we moved her down there, and she had more business than she'd ever had, and it didn't hurt any of the other sponsors. It's just she happened to have a really right. kind of lousy location. But I would have never known that if I hadn't talked to her. And then, you know, she and might she was have, being very polite about she it. She was, and yeah. and, and um, she might have never said anything bad. But you know what she does now? She doesn't tells come back. Oh my God, I was down there, and they moved me because you know because we right. care. We we actually do. So it. You know, it's like I said, the most self-interested thing you can do is to is to be interested in other people. What do you think, Roland, will take where you're at now, which is very impressive, you know, five, six, seven thousand to get into the stadium? Yeah, it, it takes I don't think that we get there the way that we've gotten here. Right. Um, and, and so what what we identified was that um, if we want to be like Dreamforce is my model. Dreamforce's Salesforce is yeah. I think 160,000 people, right? You're not going to, without a unifying theme beyond marketing, you're not going to, in my opinion, get a hundred and some thousand people to come out. You need to be a critical part of their lives, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be a critical part of their lives by simply providing courses and training. So. You have to provide a software solution, I believe, to do that that provides an incredibly valuable service. And so what we've done is we've uh, we have over the last two years added a uh, SM, a, a SaaS, a software as a service, hmm. and uh, we created a learning management system that we use for our products now that is positioned to roll out to provide hmm. uh, a huge, huge, huge market of people with an LMS. And, uh, and a couple of other things. Is, uh, there's an analytics platform that we've bought. So we're creating a suite of services, mm. modeling, modeling uh, <laughs> Salesforce, because I think if we can become mm. a significant player to SMB, small, medium-sized businesses, and enterprise, which we've now got Uber and um, HarperCollins and um, uh, Etihad Airlines and all these enterprise people now are our clients, we've... We're moving towards a place where our market can grow to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, and I can get a percentage of those into the room to learn more about that. We can open our uh, platform to third-party developers, and so so that might be a more of a answer than you want. But it's like no, that's you have to think right. about how how do well, I? Well, that's what I was saying because you come at it at okay. Here's some stuff we need to do right now: clean up the AV, get some celebrities. But like you said, it's going to take something else to get to to the next level. It is, yeah. It takes bigger partners, more team members, and and that unifying thing, that 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 real community building thing. If you're a Salesforce person or a HubSpot person, um, you're probably going to be pretty loyal to that. And 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 they do both. They both do a good job of getting the the customers on board and feeling a part of something, just like like a football team. I think about that like a football team. I'm not a sports guy, but I definitely love that people in a city think this commercial enterprise is something that they care enough about to wear the colors of. Right. That's what I want. I want them wearing our colors, right? And so that's what we're trying to create. I love that. Yeah. Let me, let me add one let me add one ahead. more thing too. Yeah. We we leave we made a decision um Trafficking the the let's call it a seminar, but the seminar industry, the event industry, in in our online marketing, digital marketing world, um, typically has a uh, format that I don't think serves the customer as well as it should, um, and I experienced it as a consumer of those events, and um, what I what I saw was that big corporate events are really about providing as much value as they can. I don't think the content's that great, but they're not selling from the stage. When I started with Traffic and Conversion Summit, the income of the event came not just from ticket sales, but it came from selling from the stage. So speakers would make an offer for a product, send people to the back of the room to buy, and that would provide significant revenue. And we decided that that experience typically creates and we would have speakers um, back in 2013 that you could pay to be on the stage you could pay to pitch basically 
Um, but what that did was it inhibited the quality of the content because the person who's on the stage delivering that sales message is typically a person who is delivering a formula that they've been taught. And all of those pitches are the same. I grew mm. up as a poor you know, child on the Mississippi River and lived out of a bathtub for 17 years. <laughs> and then I discovered this amazing digital marketing trip that rains money on me with no effort at all. Run to the back for $2,000. I gave you absolutely no value, but please give me money. And um, we turned that around and said, we're not selling anything from the stage. Um, and we're going to sell anything that we sell from a booth just like everybody else does. And that that's made a huge difference. And it's kind of funny because every year I have somebody come up and me, hey, hey, I can tell you how to make so much more money from your event. I'm like I'm like, awesome. Well, t- tell me <laughs> if you get people in the back with clipboards and order forms and then you send people to the back of the stage to buy, you're going to make so much money. And it's like, you know, we actually make millions of dollars in each of our booths at at our event, our sister companies like the war room, which I also run, um, digital marketer, which Ryan Dice and Richard, uh, Linder run and native commerce, which Perry Belcher and Karen Kang run. They all make millions of dollars for us, never selling anything, only having the booth, no tables, no clipboards and the experience and, and the professionalism and the quality of attendee that you get when you aren't focused on, the yeah. quick dollar, but it kind of ends up coming anyway, has been a huge, huge yeah. difference. I, so I think there it was a decision to sacrifice for basically a year. We had to sacrifice money. Yeah, it's but, a long term versus short term. And yeah. well, you know, I have to comment about the um, your booth at War Room. I'm not sure at what point you came up with it, but it's really genius. Obviously, it's coming from three marketing geniuses where you have it roped off, right? <laughs> you have a I think um, a, you know, all you can drink bar and you could only really get into that roped off area if you're a war room member. Yeah, How did you come a, up with that concept? Because it's not a typical booth. It's just, it's like you're it, an exclusive it, mini club within the booth is. area. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. exactly what we wanted. You know, yeah. we, you, you've got like uh, Bob Cialdini that wrote the, the influence book and, and book, now yeah. Prefluence, which is great, uh, has all of the things that, that basically make a successful marketing message and that booth has almost all of them, Mm. you know, and, uh, it has exclusivity reciprocity. I mean, pretty much all of that stuff. And, um, and the booth was the graphic was designed, um, by Perry Belcher with a a few, uh, tweaks from Ryan and me, the exclusive rope it off, uh, and put security guards in front of it was, was Perry. Perry's just, just amazing at doing that stuff. And, um, and then by accident, um, I, I just happened to see modeling, <coughs> excuse me, I happened to see that um, at other events where the people line up at booths, um, but they might not be the people you want, but the booths would basically give away beer or they would give away uh, coffee. And so I was like, okay, let's get a barista in in the morning and then let's do a bar in in the evening. Mm. And then a lot of people were like, and, and I actually, my my events coordinator, uh, she, she was she, she was like, you know, I got to keep we have to keep all these war room people out because we're trying to get people in who we can explain them. I'm like, no, no, I want we have 100 members in war room, right? Uh-huh. I want all those people in the booth because I want the booth buzzing at all times. And I'm happy to pay the money to have them drink the coffee and, and have the liquor because our booth looks incredibly busy and you can't get in because you got security guards in front and it's roped off and we have celebrities that are in there. And I mean, it's like it. It just for sure accidentally yeah. and intentionally became something amazing. And and for a tiny little booth like that to do over a million dollars in, in a couple of days is is pretty cool, you know? Very cool. Yeah. You know what when you talk it makes me think of a few things, Roland, which is you have you know, other people, Richard, you, Ryan, Perry, all very, very smart individuals and I would imagine when you're making decisions, not everyone always agrees on the right path or on a path. Mm -hmm. What was a time where people just had varying opinions? How do you move forward with all these great track records, smart minds? What do you do? Arm wrestle? I mean, what what, what happens? That that also is, is a good question. And the, the answer is that, um, 
it did not always work as well as it works now because originally when I came into the company, it was um, Ryan and Perry ran everything. Right. And um, the challenge was that they have very different management styles. Mm. And neither one is completely correct or completely wrong. But what you can't have is opposing management styles so that then and they would literally say this that that ryan would come in and basically tell the team we're doing this 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 and this and then it's brian goes on vacation with his family and perry comes in and goes no we're not doing that that and that we're doing this this and this and people are like okay but eventually they're just like i don't want to do anything it's a tug of war right it is literally a push me pull you right so um so we Talked about it and um, decided. And you come in, you're like, whatever they say, don't listen to either of them. This is what you're doing. That's what I should have done, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the triple confusion. <laughs> but no, what I did, and, and the benefit of uh, long time practicing law and doing deals and negotiating and stuff is you can come in from the outside with altitude and say, it looks like the challenge is this and this. And um, so we decided that what made sense was because Ryan was the face at the time of digital marketer, which at the time was a personality brand. We have moved it from a personality brand to a brand. But, um, but anyway, it was like, well, it makes sense for Ryan to be at digital marketer because that's, you know, that's his face and, you know, and everything. And Perry to be at native commerce because his whole background is physical products and that, that was a natural, easy split. And since we did that, uh, it made a huge, huge difference. The teams are happier. And we, you know, we did make the decision that it was going to double up our teams. So now mm-hmm. we have we have duplicate kinds of people at each of those companies. But we also now have two companies that have two different valuations that are completely different based on the niches that they're in that could be sold separately, that can be funded separately. We've diversified our risk. We've diversified our team. So it, it it's worked out really well. So now to answer your question about what happens now, even though that we've done that when people disagree, we have, we are all fully capable of aggressively stating our positions (laughs) and, um, and we also all have tremendous respect for each other, which is critical to any relationship. And, um, we've never had a situation where, uh, where it came down to a vote. We, we do have the ability, since there's three of us, to break a tie. Right. And in Digital Marketer, there's actually four of us because Richard Lindner uh, is a partner there. Richard's actually also a partner in the overall thing, um, but, it, but, but has somehow managed to stay out of the fray, which now that, you, now that I think about that, I'm going to have to pull him into the fray. But, um, Sorry, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's truly, when you have a group of people who, who manage by consensus um, and respect the territory of someone else. Like Ryan, Ryan made a decision not long ago about expanding and um, uh, the company that um, that we were not completely certain of, and um, and we defer to him on that, even though we might not 100% agree with that particular thing. And Perry, same thing. Perry has a couple of things that he's you know said he wanted to do that they haven't agreed on, and and I have too. And we've all most always lost money each time we didn't listen to the other one either. So I'm not going to say that that doesn't help because, uh, um, it's in your mind that you don't want to take, uh, you don't want to take crap from the other people. If your thing doesn't work out, if they weren't supporting it, so right, you really exactly. want to get them on board to support it. <laughs> so people, respect is, is yeah, it sounds like kind of people stay within a certain lane cause they have a certain territory and certain expertise. Yeah. And those people tend to lead those things a little bit more, but get the feedback from everyone else. They do. Yeah. Um, Roland, first of all, thank you so much for your time. I have one last question. It's sort of two questions in one, but um, where should we point people towards? Um, Obviously, there's a lot of places that they should check out. Digital Marketer, right? They should check out Traffic and Conversion, Fantastic Conference, Native Commerce. You guys got content and commerce. What, What else have we missed that people should go and check out? Um, their War Room Mastermind, War I think, room. is yeah, War Room, yeah, is insanely valuable and has has really great people. We have a a new experiment that I was telling you about called the Founders Board, 
which has been super fun and, and kind of has my attention right now and, okay. and is a Talk about the Founders Board for a second. So I'm, I'm, I'm making sorry? three questions. Yeah, so talk about Founders Board for a, for a second. That's your sure. new cool experiment, more than an experiment, really. It is. Uh, it, it, it's My background is... Uh, is very business oriented and um, lots of buying companies and selling companies and things like that. And um, I have, uh, I've owned and built a lot of businesses and um, I, I wanted something that I could focus more on that kind of stuff than just the marketing stuff. Cause a lot of the stuff that we do is really focused on, on marketing and, um, and marketing is, is a critical component as is sales but business is too, and it's a different game than than those games. So I wanted to have something where we could really help our our people, both in War Room and our other uh, contacts and connections, by showing them how to 10x or 100x a business. Yeah. Uh, and we have a great track record of that. There's there's 24 of them. Uh, I'm thinking about our our proof proof page. Um, there's 24 businesses now that. Um, that I've grown to a million dollars or more and, and many more with Perry and Ryan added. And I think there's 15 of them that have gone to 10 million and three at a hundred. Wow. So that's a pretty good track record. Yeah. And, and there's a system and a framework around that. And so founders board is, uh, is four things really. It is, um, it is war room for the mastermind. It is, we're going to the three M's, right? It is, um, it is for modeling, this thing that we call the founders board intensive and founder board. It is mentoring through, um, an advisory service that we provide where we become your advisory board. Hmm. So it has all three of the M's and then it also has, and I, maybe you can help me brainstorm, uh, the community side. But one of the challenges that I have found as an entrepreneur is that I love this stuff so much um, that I would talk about it all the time. And I yeah. tell people, I say, if I had to work another job to be able to do this for free, I would, it's just super awesome that this right. pays pretty well. But, um, but my family gets pretty sick of hearing, you know, this is amazing. This is a cool thing. And these are our numbers and take a look at this dashboard. Isn't that cool? Uh, so having, having a group of people that you can do social things with as well. Right. Uh, so I'm looking for an M that works for community, but having that, group of people that you can do social things with as well that have those common interests and you don't necessarily have to talk about business. I mean, you kind of can't help it because it's, it's part of your fiber, but, um, but you don't, you don't want to talk about that all the time, but you also want people that are your peers that can play on the level you play on that can do the things that you want to do that can hang, you know, financially, intellectually, experientially. Um, that is, that is a component. So those are, that's really the place we want to go. And, and founders board is the, um, is the mentoring side of that quadrangle of things. Where can people find out more about that? Right now it's, it's on a, in a horribly named page, uh, that has a story behind it, but it's on a horribly named page called 1892 society, uh, hmm. com forward slash 1892. So that obviously, I thought it was going to be way worse than that. That's not that bad. Oh, okay. Well, good. Yeah. I think it's horrible right now, but, um, it's kind of, you know, the secret society type of situation. So yes. we did buy foundersboard.com. So but why, why use that when you have 1892 society? Why use that when you can do forward slash 1892. But, um, yeah, so here, let me tell you just briefly. the Go story. Ahead, yeah. So, so when we're trying to, to think of what we're going to call this, um, uh, I Googled, because uh, at the time it was kind of mastermindy and it, it, it's become more mentory. But anyway, I, uh, I Googled the most successful masterminds in history. Mm. And uh, I found that there were really seven of them. Mm. And um, I had looked at some friends of mine who had different models. And some of them were in the $400 a month range. And some of them were in the uh, $1,860 a month range. And I preferred the 1800 and some to the 400. Uh, and it turned out that some of the masterminds were in the 400s. And one of them in particular was, was founded in 1892. It was called mm. the steel mill masterminds and it was Andrew Carnegie. Wow. And out of the steel mill masterminds came most of 
the managerial and technological innovation of the industrial age. Yeah. So I was like, that's really cool. And it has the benefit of 1892 uh, of being 1892, which is kind of the price point that I was looking for. So <laughs> I didn't realize start... that. Okay, I was thinking year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was the year, but I needed a year that matched my price point that I wanted. So, <laughs> uh, so I was like 1892. That's that's it. It's perfect. So what you know? Yeah. So 1892society.com slash 1892. Um, people should check it out. Um, and it's really for larger scale companies. So, yeah, you, right. you, we, we're, that is really focused on people who are, we, we have six stages of business. You have uh, startup, then you have traction where your product market fit comes from your build, measure, learn loop, right? Then you get the constraint phase where, you know, things were going awesome and now I need talent, I need money, I have, you know, uh, uh, market size challenges, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you get to growth after that and maturity and decline. And, and um, we really want to not focus on the startups. We really want to focus on helping people get traction. We want to help people get product market fit. We want to help people through the constraint phase. And we want to help people who are in the growth phase see how important it is and the benefit, which, which is amazing, of selling your company. And, um, and, and get past some of the challenges that stop you from thinking you can sell a company that it's not good enough. It's, it's absolutely good enough if it gets professionalized with the right kinds of things and, um, that they're going to leave it to their kids or family. Probably the worst decision you can make only about 2% of businesses make it through a few generations. Uh, only about 30, oh. I think it's 28% past one generation and your kids and your family probably don't want your business, right? They want yeah. money to do what they want to do. Mm. Um, so, so it's really to to kind of help people through those challenges. And so you need a business that's actually operating for us to be able to provide, you know, the twenty one things that we do to to ten x to hundred x businesses. What do your kids want to do? My kids, um, one of them is twenty six. And, uh, though he will tell you that he absolutely positively does not follow in my footsteps at all, he does because he has, um, he has gone out and partnered with influencers, uh, with YouTube influencers mm. and, um, has several of them right now that he has created products with and markets. Um, but yesterday, uh, we did a reception at the end of this, 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 uh, this 1892 intensive thing. And, uh, and he's there, and uh, somebody said, "Oh, you followed in his footsteps." And he's like, "No, I didn't." <laughs> I was like, "But you did." So anyway, <laughs> he's doing that. But what's awesome is, um, and and this is to me, like we we were talking about this the other day. Is to me, um, our my my other my other son is uh, twenty, and he has just come to us and said um, he's tired of being he was pizza delivery guy mm -hmm. he was he is uh, currently a coffee barista but he came and he said you know what i really want to do something more i want to make more money i want to be able to be responsible for a family mm. and we were just like you know this is well, he's only 20 i mean you have some time is, yeah this is fantastic and uh well he's in an environment of you know hyper overachievers yeah uh, so so what's cool about that is i said i'll tell you what Tell me what you're making doing this. And he said, I'm making $1,500 a month. I said, fantastic. I said, I'll give you a paid internship with me. I want you to come to all of the meetings like your brother did. And I want you to, uh, I'm going to send you down to Austin and train with our sponsorship sales team. And then we will come up with, I want you to go through all the DM cert, digital marketer certifications. And with that trio of training, you can't help but be successful. And I told him, and then my wife and I, and several of our friends were talking about this afterwards in different conversations is is it's just such a gift to your child or a friend or an acquaintance to be able to help them see that the freedom that you get when you can make money to do whatever you want to impact whatever you want mm -hmm. uh is is life-changing game-changing liberating um, euphoric, right? And that, that so many people get stuck 
in an hourly job like like a barista like like let's, let's look at the all the people who are arguing for a $15 minimum wage right because they can't make it and it's I don't know how they make it I don't know how you make it on $15 an hour I don't know how you make it on $50 an hour or, or even a hundred but um, the the cool thing is is that there's this whole world that the listeners of your show that you and I and now my kids know about that is absolutely limitless. You can create a million dollars in a month. Um, you can create ten million dollars in a month, and um, you can do that, or you can make eight dollars an hour. And that, to me, is absolutely stunning. And a lot of the time, it's simply being lucky enough to be in your dad's car and look back and see a torn up ugly cassette thing mm. with Dennis Denise Waitley's name Denise, on it, or, yeah. I have or, that I have that cassette case exactly what you're talking about you yeah. do yeah that's yes. funny. <laughs> yeah so that that to me is is just fascinating when you think about it that 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 a life a human life is really only limited by the exposure to the possibilities of what we know can be done and the mindset of taking the action to do it. That is the only thing yeah. that really separates the people who are free to do whatever they want in their lives from the people who are slaves to an hourly wage. That's, that's kind of interesting. So, Roland, do you have a book in you at some point? I do. I do, yeah. What's, I, what's... Um, I actually do, and uh, I wrote one that was published in the legal field and in all the bookstores a long time ago. And then I saw I that one. and I'm like, it can't be the same one. It was, it was some, I remember it was very financial, the financial asset title protection for everyone, which is what yeah. I used to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, asset protection. It was published in 97. Yeah. Which I yeah. wrote in five days because the publisher came to me and said, we need a book on asset protection cause it's hot. If you will write that book for us in five days, we will put it in all the bookstores. And I said, I will absolutely write that book in five days. <laughs> But I wrote another book um, called Life Without Limits, which I didn't ever publish, but I've given to a lot of my friends. Hmm. That's kind of my my legacy book. I read the Benjamin Franklin autobiography, and what mm -hmm. really stuck with the two, two huge takeaways for me from that mm -hmm. book were Benjamin Franklin was one of the most successful negotiators hmm. ever because he planted in people's brains that whatever thing he wanted, whatever outcome he wanted them to come to was their idea. Hmm. And that is something that has been amazingly good uh, for me to do to help people through kind of a Socratic method of asking questions, right. lead them to the conclusion that I think will benefit both them and me. And the other thing was, is that he wrote that as a legacy for his kids of basically this is this is kind of how I think you might want to consider the possibility of living your life because I found these things to be good for me. And so I wrote the life without limits book basically for my kids that I did not have at the time. Hmm. Uh, but now what I have done is, um, a lot of my friends have written books and a lot of them are very well known. And, um, so what I found that I wasn't doing, I told, I would tell people all the time, I was like, all these people with these stories, I don't have any stories. And uh, my wife and the kids. You like, said that? Yeah, my wife and kids, because because they all have uh, like Perry's Mister Stories got all these amazing stories and uh, and all these people that have written these books. I'm like, gosh, these are great stories. And um, and I was like, I just don't have any. And they're all like, you're an idiot. You absolutely <laughs> have stories. And so this right. was it this year. I think it was this year. Um, they were like, you are sitting down with us. And we are going to tell you all of the stories that you tell us. Mm. And they did, and I made a list of them. And now I'm like, that's awesome. I, it turns out I do have a couple of stories. I have actually quite a few of them. And so I've written all those down, and now I am tying the the kind of lessons to the adventures of those. And I have, you know, I, I have lived, you know, probably 19 lives instead of seven. But uh, it's, and I have a couple of things that I think are interesting to people to weave in. You know, like I visited 150 countries. That's that's an unusual thing, and um, and tying those in. So I'm I'm trying to. I realize I, what I want is I don't want a book that is simply 
instructional one, two, three. I want something that yeah. is entertaining and interesting as well. Yes. So, so when when is this book going to come out? Um, is it going to be the extended edition of Life Without Limits, or is it going to be from scratch? These here's stories. What's, here's an interesting exercise. However old you are right now, write a book that you think you want to give to your kids that that tells them what you think about a whole bunch of things right now. And I did that in 1995 and then read that 20, 30 years later and you will be like, I was just so stupid. I can't believe I thought, I mean, there's lots of things that I still think about, but it's like the evolution of those ideas has been truly interesting. It actually would probably be an interesting book to say, this is, you know, maybe you call it then and now. The evolution, but, right, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but I do have a, a fantastic title that, that Perry helped me with and um, all my stories that my family helped me with. And so it, it will definitely be out in 2018. So I could feel like I, I'm going to – you're a busy man. You have to have a, a lot of things to attend to. But what's one of your favorite stories that you think will make it in the book? Uh, one of my favorite stories is in Africa. I, lo I love to take – uh, nature pictures. And so I'm an avid photographer and, um, and I love to travel. So traveling while taking pictures of animals is, is wonderful for me. And, um, so I was on a safari by myself in Africa. I was in Botswana on the Zambezi river. Uh, the leading cause of death on the Zambezi river is hippo attacks. Wow. And those um, things are ferocious. Eh? They're amazingly ferocious. And so I was, uh, I was in a boat taking pictures of four elephants that were kind enough to be by the riverbank with their getting water. They get water and put it on their backs and then wallow in the mud to provide protection from the sun and things like that. So I got a family of elephants uh, doing the spray thing and I'm trying to get them like all in unison. So it kind of <laughs> has the perfect thing. And these pictures take like, you'll sit there for an hour and a half to just get, uh, no, no, don't do that. Just do a little bit more. So, but I do notice over, about 200 yards away is, um, I think they call it a pod of, of hippos. And, um, and the, the male was kind of eyeing us up and, you know, the, my guide said, you know, we got to watch that guy, you know, if he gets too close, we'll, we'll have to, to take off. And so I'm taking the pictures and, and I see him getting closer and closer and I'm like, should we go? And he's like, eh, not yet. We go get a little bit of time. I was like, okay, taking my pictures. <laughs> and, um, then he gets really significantly closer and he's about, uh, maybe 20 yards away. And um, the guy goes, yeah, it's, it's time for us to go. So he goes and he pulls the motor, the cord on the motor to start, and the cord flies out of his hand and lands in the water and sinks, and the motor is not started, and the hippo is getting closer and closer. And I'm like, this is not a good choice. I can jump out towards the hippo, guaranteed death, I can jump out towards the elephants where there's a baby elephant, guaranteed charge, death, goring. Uh, or I can swim away in the opposite direction where all the crocodiles are, which is, you know, guaranteed maiming, you know. So so maiming, certain death, goring, you know, no, no good options. I'm truly thinking this. And I'm like, and then I'm going to be out because my guide sure as hell isn't going to hang around. It's it's going to be, you know, <laughs> the... I don't have to. I don't have to outrun the elephants or the hippos. I just have to run faster than you. <laughs> yes. So I'm like, okay, I'm I'm pretty much screwed if we can't get this started. And I'm looking around in the boat, and um, the life preserver, which I did not elect to wear, has this white band on it. And so I rip the band off of the life preserver, and um, we coil it around the thing and mm. pull it, and the thing goes blip 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 blip. And the you know now the hippo is closer and I'm kind of hanging out in the boat looking at the hippo and wrap it around again pull it and the third time wow. it starts I have a picture of the hippo's mouth open like that literally two feet from me because I was taking that as my last picture before I literally jumped out of the boat and it started and we pulled away and the hippo just kind of was like you know then their eyes are all like like here you know right but that 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 was to me just a fantastic experience where there was there was no way that you would survive if you panicked uh, the only thing that you could do was try to rapidly innovate 
on a different way to make this this one thing that could save your butt happen. Was the guy freaking out? He was. Um, I think he was confident that he could that he could outrun me. Really? He was. <laughs> like he, was, he was. He was already he was, thinking that. He was. Uh, no, he was really nervous. Um, he was. He was absolutely frantically pulling the thing and wrapping it around. This, like, if I collapsed all this, that last little bit uh, of how fast the the hippo came and we took that off and and wound wow. it. Wow. It felt like it took thirty minutes, but it was probably just a couple, like five and, seconds, right? Yeah. So so we were we were um, definitely very happy. Once we left that area, sighing a big sigh of relief. I'm sighing relief. Damn. <laughs> Roland, thank you so much thank for sharing you. the stories and for your time. Um, everyone should check out all those sites we mentioned. And uh, I just want to be the first one to thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I really appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 